your ways back to your seats. In this next hour, you're going to hear from three commissioners, some you've already heard from today, about a topic that we typically fund every year. It's my personality, my magnet. Our Medicaid waivers, uh, the current Medicaid unwinding process as it relates to the federal health emergency, and then also about an issue that's been specifically important to me, but I know to other members as well, hoteling and the services surrounding our complex youth in our state. We've asked Commissioner Kaylee Noggle from DCH, Commissioner Candace Brooks from DS, DHA, DHS, I'm sorry, and Commissioner Kevin Tanner, if he'd hang around uh, and give us an update and some presentations on where we're, where we're at on that and also problems that we still may need to address. So, commissioners, I know y'all have already talked. However you wish to lay out this hour, we leave it to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Chairman Tillery and Chairman Hatchett and to all the members, great to be with you for a second time this afternoon and you get me one more time after this. So we'll try to, um, there's a lot of information that we're going to cover today, but we'll try to be succinct. But again, I'm Kaylee Noggle, Commissioner of the Department of Community Health, and I'm joined today by Commissioner Bros of the Department of Human Services and the Division of Family and Children's Services and Commissioner Kevin Tanner, who you just heard from the Department of, from Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And we are going to talk to you about the status of Medicaid waivers, Medicaid unwinding, hoteling and services for Georgia's complex youth. Again, I'm going to do my own slides. We'll see how it goes. We've included a couple of high-level slides just to delineate the responsibilities between the health agencies because I think we get that a lot. Um, there's four main health agencies. So DCH is a single state Medicaid agency responsible for oversight and administration of all Medicaid funding and programming, as well as health care facility licensure, regulation, as well as the state health benefit plan like we talked about earlier. The Department of Public Health, Dr. Toomey, is not with us today, but as you know, they're focused on emergency preparedness, as we all know, infectious disease and vital records. But if you've heard Dr. Toomey speak lately, you know that she's most excited about refocusing her efforts on maternal and child health now that she has a little bit more bandwidth. And I know I speak for the three of us that we're all excited to join her in those efforts. The Department of Behavioral Health and Develop De Developmental Disability serves as a state safety network for mental health crises. They manage five state hospitals and they manage several of the Medicaid waiver programs. The Department of Human Services and the Department of Family and Children's Services is the operational entity for us that determines HHS benefit eligibility for nearly all Georgians, as well as being responsible for all of child welfare, foster care, and adoption assistance, as well as aging services. And together, those four agencies make up the four sister health agencies. Our team will be distributing to each of you in your offices and your assistants a, sheet, a cheat sheet of who to call by topic area in the coming, coming days. So be on the lookout from that, from Brandy Sylvan, our Director of Government Relations. Since caring for children falls under each of our agency in a number of different ways, we thought it important to highlight who pays for what and for whom and when for these children. DCH covers nearly 1.7 million youth under, under Medicaid managed care, mostly children of low income mothers and children in foster care. Under the fee-for-service Medicaid model, financial responsibilities and programmatic responsibilities are shared across DBHDD and DCH. DCH and Medicaid cover services for children with a disability or blindness or children with complex cases on our waiver programs, oftentimes with DBHDD providing the state matching funds and the provider network. And then independently, DBHDD covers and funds with state funding around 165,000 youth and all uninsured youth in Georgia who are experiencing a mental health crisis. So I'm going to share a few Medicaid-specific updates with you, and then I'll turn it over to my fellow commissioners to, to provide some updates as well. And first is a little bit of a status on waivers and state plan amendments, or SPAs. And I think it's really important to talk about the difference of those between the two when we talk about them. A waiver is a very policy-intensive and budget-heavy initiative where we're essentially asking the federal government to grant us a waiver from some federal code or law essentially of the Social Security Act, either a 1915 waiver or an 1115 waiver, we're asking them to give us flexibility to do something that's not currently in federal law, thereby waiving federal law. They're really intensive efforts and take 
usually 18 months or more to develop the policy, to design an implementation plan, to craft a budget and pass required budget neutrality testing, and to develop an ongoing monitoring and evaluation plan to ensure that what we're attempting to do satisfy, satisfies CMS requirements, that it's in a line with what they want us to do. And again, they're in the driver's seat on a lot of these approvals and certainly subject to their timeline. On the other hand, a state plan amendment is an adjustment or an addition or a change to our existing state plan, which is essentially the statement of what Medicaid covers. It defines what benefits are eligible to what populations, what we pay for, and at what rate and what instances. And so a state plan is just really tweaking that, adding a service, removing a service, or changing maybe the rate that we pay for something. They both require our board approval, public comment period, and like I mentioned, CMS approval. And keep in mind that, again, it's CMS's timeline, and they can stop the clock on that approval anytime they want to by asking us a question. So as you can see, I wanted to highlight where we are today. In FY22, we had one waiver that was submitted for a rule, for, excuse me, a renewal that's been approved. And in FY23, we had two waiver programs, again, renewals, that we've submitted and are currently pending approval. On the state plan amendment front, in FY22, we had 15 submitted state plan amendments, and a lot of those come out of things that you passed in budget, rate increases or addition of uh, a number of different services. All of those from FY22 except for one has currently been approved. So far to date in FY23, we've submitted 12 state plan amendments and we've had two, pa or, excuse me, approved thus far. A dental rate increase and our, move, and our move to cover postpartum coverage for 12 months has also been approved at this point. In our discussion on care and services for Georgia's youth, we think it's critically important to talk about CMO procurement. Managed care is the delivery model for over 70% of our Medicaid population. Their care is managed and delivered through one of these three care manage, man, management organizations, excuse me, or CMOs. These contracts today are worth over $6 billion and they're up for procurement again. Many of you have already heard me say in other venues that these new contracts are our best next opportunity to reprioritize what we want as a state for our members. Commissioner Brose will share some updates later regarding hoteling and talk about some of the projects we're working on together. But this procurement and these contracts are how and when DCH will be able to really change the services that we offer for Georgia's children and deliver newer, more innovative services. One of our CMOs has already launched a predictive analytics tool that will assess a child's risk of needing a PRTF or a ho hotel stay and have added more than 40 staff members over this year to provide additional case management services to identify those youth. One of the CMOs is developing a tool that will assess a child's risk of being placed in foster care before it even happens and are providing additional case management services to try to address that as well. There are other new tools that we're considering as part of this effort as well, including increased data sharing efforts across our agencies and with the creation of something like a health passport that we've seen other states utilize successfully, where a child's health care information is, con is consolidated into a single location that's available to both DFACS or DBHDD or any one of the providers that they end up seeing at, at a moment's notice. Or closed group re referral system, where a child is, and their family is not only referred to services within the community, but that referral is tracked and followed up on to make sure that services were received. As well as exploring new ways that we can leverage existing federal and state Medicaid dollars to address social determinants of health that we know are so important. But you've also probably heard me say that one of the biggest pieces of this procurement effort will be drafting contracts and defining the right metrics and performance guarantees and for the department to build the capacity to manage to those standards. For a number of years, DCH has conducted annual contract compliance reviews. But since last year, we've also engaged an independent third party to develop a system to review additional performance standards and to monitor ongoing compliance and monthly and annual reporting, re providing to us an independent recommendation of required corrective action plans, to follow up on those corrective action plans when necessary, or to assess or to recommend potential penalties and fines for noncompliance. And, and that should be functional even as early as this spring. We'll continue to work with our partners at both DHS and DBHDD on their feedback and input as we continue to develop that RFP. I'm going to use a phrase from Director Farr for a moment, but he continually says that the budget is a statement of our priorities. And similarly, this procurement and these contracts are a statement of our health care priorities for these members and our expectation for their health care outcomes. 
Our needs and our expectations have changed since the last time these contracts were developed in 2015 and 2016, and we know that we can do better for our members. It's important that we craft the RFP and the performance language in such a way that it meets the need of, needs of the shared populations that we all collectively serve as health agencies. The program touches millions of lives, more so than anything else that the department will do in the coming few years, and doing this single initiative right is our number one priority for this year. If we talk about where we are in terms of the RFP process and timeline, we started planning over a year and a half ago. Last summer, we issued an RFI, or Request for Information, from potential bidders and providers and constituencies. We conducted extensive stakeholder feedback, listening sessions, with many advocates that are probably represented here today and in the hallways, um, as well as our sister agencies. A couple of weeks ago, we issued an RFQC, or a Request for Qualified Contractors, which is a simple, uh, essential um, step in this process where we can pre-vet potential bidders to make sure that they have the experience and qualifications before we even allow them to submit a bid on the RFP. We expect the RFP to be issued later this spring, hopefully with the notice of intent to award issued sometime this summer, and then an eventual implementation and contract execution by July 1 of 2024. You'll notice that there's about a year in there from contract notice of award to actual implementation for a couple of reasons. One, that's to ensure minimal disruption and a smooth transition for our members, and also to allow us time to alleviate any potential protests or lawsuits. The public health emergency and Medicaid unwinding, I want to provide a, just one brief note of clarification. The public health emergency at the federal level has not ended as, and is not ending. It has actually been extended until April 11th. And many of the flexibilities related to the public health emergency are continuing, such as our flexibilities around providing telehealth flexibilities for providers and flexibilities for our Medicaid members around suspension of copay premiums and, and member co uh, cost sharing. However, what is ending, or what's been decoupled, is the requirement for continuous enrollment eligibility for Medicaid members. It was decoupled from the actual public health emergency and the Consolidated Appropriations Act that passed this past December by Congress. So as a result of that, beginning in April, states can begin to redetermine Medicaid eligibility and remove members from the roles that are no longer eligible. Obviously, this is gonna be a huge undertaking. We've got 2.7 million Medicaid members, who, who, all of whom eligibility needs to be redetermined over the course of the next 12 months. And we've been working on an interagency effort for, for many, many months now, especially since we didn't know when it was gonna happen until recently. D DCH is responsible for maintaining overall oversight and communicating and co coordinating with CMS. But DHS and DFAX has really taken the lead on the operational effort, and we're thankful to Commissioner Bros and her team for doing so. They'll, her team of, and staff that conduct eligibility determinations will ultimately be responsible for doing that. And, and I know she's going to share some more about that with you in just a few moments. I want to share briefly with you on what this continuous eligibility enrollment has meant in terms of Medicaid enrollment and dollars. In FY20, before the start of the public health emergency, we had about 2.1 million Medicaid members. Since that time, in FY23, our member roles are now about 2.7 million, representing a growth of over 570,000 members, or 25% growth in Medicaid enrollment since the start of the pandemic. If we look at what we would have project projected in growth by the department, at the start of the PHG, without considering the public health emergency, we would have projected over these past three years about 5% growth in Medicaid enrollment as opposed to the 25. And on back of the envelope, we know that that cost difference to the program is about $3 billion. I'll talk, touch briefly on timeline because I know Commissioner uh, Bros will touch a little bit, but again, this continuous enrollment requirement will end in March. We'll start redeterminations in April. At the same time, our enhanced federal uh, matching percentage, DCH gets about 6.2 extra percentage points in federal cost sharing right now on these Medicaid members. That will start to wind down as well, and you'll see that throughout our budget in both amended and FY24. And then those redeterminations will continue over the next 12 to 14 months until we ultimately redetermine all of our members. I'm gonna pause there. I'll be back for questions in a few moments, but thank you for your time, and I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Brose and let, you, let her walk you through her updates as well as the operational plan. All 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to all the chairmen and members of this committee and members of the General Assembly, for the new members, my name is Candace Brose and I serve as Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Human Services. I have several members of my staff here, including my Chief of Staff, Craig Foster, and Deputy Chief Matthew Kroll, Deputy Commissioner Demetrius Taylor, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Melissa Barwick, and Deputy Commissioner Melody Debussy. Many of you know her well from her days in the Senate, Senate Budget Office specifically. The Georgia Department of Human Services is the state's largest agency with nearly 11,000 employees, over 230 offices statewide and three main divisions, the Family and Children's Services Division, Child Support Services, and Aging Services. We serve millions of families across our state through foster care, adult protective services, child support enforcement, public guardianship, fraud investigations, refugee resettlement, and administration of federal benefit programs, including Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF. As Commissioner Noggle mentioned, throughout the federal public health emergency, Medicaid recipients across the nation have received continuous coverage to mitigate the pandemic's negative impacts. But starting April 1st, 2023, roughly 2.7 million Georgians on Medicaid will need to be redetermined. In other words, have their eligibility checked again. Their statuses have been frozen during this time. Since the public health emergency has remained in effect for over two years, we now anticipate roughly 545,000 Georgians will be found ineligible for Medicaid and tra transition to healthcare.gov for private insurance. But to be clear, there, if someone is possibly going to lose their Medicaid, we're gonna check every possible form of Medicaid to ensure that they're eligible for none of those before we would even go into transitioning them to healthcare.gov. Georgia must complete all redetermination work by May 2024, and working closely with OPB, the Governor's Office of Health Strategy and Coordination, and DCH, we have been investing heavily in technology, workflow efficiencies, and workforce development to prepare. We've retrained current employees and we are aggressively hiring new ones, and right now we have 834 employees ready to handle this work. With redeterminations expected to increase their existing caseloads by more than 200%, going from roughly 114 cases per month per worker to a projected 353 cases per month per worker. And keep in mind that while we are redetermining Medicaid cases, we will continue to receive new benefit applications, process renewals, and handle appeals. The Biden administration has issued extensive guidance for states to prepare for unwinding activities. But of all recommended measures, they have most emphasized the need for ex parte renewals, which is essentially the automation of eligibility verification using the client's current information in Georgia Gateway, that's the database where we'll be doing this work, alongside several built-in data interfaces. And currently, we are building ex parte functionality into Gateway, which will eliminate countless hours of manual casework, making the process easier for our constituents and lessening human error. Additionally, we are expanding functionality for sending out required legal notices and processing appeals, which will be handled by the Office of State Administrative Hearings. In the governor's budget recommendations, which I'll walk through by program in greater detail later on today, there are several big additions to ensure system and workforce readiness. The governor has added more money for newly hired eligibility staff to cover their salaries, funding for hundreds more, and one-time investments in technology for better legal notices, system automation, and security. And for each of these, we would deeply appreciate your support, and we thank the governor for these resources. Behind the scenes, we're working tirelessly to get ready, and just as importantly, we are blanketing the state with information about Medicaid unwinding to raise public awareness before it starts. Last September, DHS and DCH kicked off a statewide marketing campaign with TV ad buys, radio spots, and print using our mascot, George the Peach. He's got very big googly eyes. I don't know if any of you have seen him in recent coverage, but he's everywhere to encourage people to check their gateway accounts, update their information, and opt into paperless communications. Like so many of our state agency counterparts, workforce remains a top issue. And for our department, we have struggled to find and retain front office employees for local branches to answer phones, assist walk-ins, and handle documents. Still, we recognize that some Georgians prefer in-person assistance. And for Medicaid unwinding, it's a necessity. 
As a result, we've reopened 158 offices across our state, and all DFACS offices now offer at least one day per week of in-person operations. We will continue to phase more and more of um, those hours and offices in as we hire staff. We've also purchased self-help terminals for 411 public libraries for those Georgians without reliable internet. And given the time constraints, I cannot detail all of our efforts thus far or the more complicated nuances of how unwinding will pan out, but I do want to thank the Department of Audits and Accounts for conducting an independent review of our preparedness last summer. The final report, which really does get into the nuances, including important timelines and what constituents should expect, is available on their website, and we will continue to post important updates about Medicaid unwinding at staycovered.ga.gov, should any of you have any questions. I will pivot now to hoteling. The department's Division of Family and Children's Services investigates child abuse and neglect 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If an investigation uncovers child abuse or neglect and the child's safety cannot be assured, we seek custody in juvenile court. To properly enter foster care, a child must be legally dependent, with dependent essentially defined as abused or neglected. Right now, we have 10,750 children in foster care, aged 0 to 17, and 655 aged 18 to 21. Of those, 2,708 are placed with relatives, 6,657 are placed with foster families, and 1,314 are living in a congregate care or group home setting. Where that child goes is what we call their placement, and with whom is what we call the provider. DFAX has its own foster families, but we also contract with child placing agencies to recruit and manage their own. If we cannot first find a relative or foster family placement, we work with child caring institutions, commonly called group homes as well. Providers are ranked in a system called room board and watchful oversight, and what we pay depends on the level of supervision. More supervision means higher per diems. Children with the most complex needs, sibling groups whom we always try to keep together, the medically fragile, those with serious mental and behavioral health needs, disabled youth, sexually exploited and trafficked youth, youth with substance abuse issues, those with pending delinquency actions or criminal charges, and children with any combination of those factors often require significant supervision. But demand far exceeds supply for complex children. If a child is suicidal, homicidal, suffering from active addiction, sexually or physically aggressive, delinquent or disabled, we may be wholly unable to find an appropriately equipped foster family or group home for placement. As a result, on any given night in Georgia, roughly 50 to 70 children in foster care with complex needs will sleep in a local office or hotel, a heartbreaking practice that we call hoteling. DFAC spends an average of $1,500 state dollars every night to hotel a foster child, which covers their room, contracted behavior aids for supervision if our staff cannot provide it, food and transportation, and property damage. In state fiscal year 2022, DFAC spent $28,075,906 in hoteling costs. Through November in state fiscal year 2023, we've spent $15,063,121 in hoteling. Since joining this agency, we have been hell-bent on ending hoteling, a practice born out of necessity but one that contradicts our mission, crushes our workforce, and derails life-saving work. You cannot make progress on your foster care cases if you are supervising a high-needs child in the office or a hotel room. Burnout is imminent. And once you quit, your caseload is immediately redistributed among the remaining resilient few. Plus, hoteling makes zero sense financially with $1,500 per day to hotel a child, and in comparison, anywhere from $75 to $210, the maximum watchful oversight range for placing a child with a foster family or group home. Given those realities, we launched a pilot project paying enhanced per diems and one-time emergency grants for children in or at imminent risk of entering a hotel or office, and we cover emergency staffing at several facilities to prevent placements from going offline. Since then, we've paid $1.4 million in enhanced per diems, eight, over $800,000 in emergency grants, and over $5 million in staffing for nine providers. And if a provider gets enhanced funding, they are prohibited from ejecting that child for at least six months, absent extraordinary circumstances, or else they become ineligible. 
Already we've seen far fewer placement disruptions and thus more stability for the children, in some cases allowing them to safely step down to lower levels of supervision. In tandem, we created a new role, our complex care coordinator, who is focused on working with providers, agencies, and healthcare personnel to prevent hoteling or remove a child from a hotel or office. Our strategies to reduce and ultimately end hoteling are working. Last June, we broke an all-time record with the lowest number of children being hoteled statewide with less than 20 total. Now a child in our custody spends on average fewer total days being hoteled and we have ended short stays for children without the highest levels of need. These days the children with the longest stretches in a hotel or office are the most complex youth in our custody and sometimes new high needs youth are entering our custody faster than we can secure placements for existing hotel youth. The battle continues but to win the war we need reinforcements. We must address the pipeline of children entering our custody and ending up hoteled when they should have never entered foster care. It only takes what feels like a handful of those cases to upend the entire system. Last night, there were 63 children hoteled statewide. 52% are male, 48% are female, 16% have a confirmed or suspected autism diagnosis, 11% have an IQ below 70, and 40% have a history of delinquency, which means that they have had run-ins with the juvenile justice system or they have pending criminal charges being prosecuted as adults. Four children are so psychiatrically acute that they have been approved by their insurance for a psychiatric residential treatment facility, but there are no beds. Of those 63 children, two-thirds were abused or neglected, and they all entered our custody with high needs. We are working hard to retain top quality foster families and group homes able to take these children and we're aggressively recruiting new ones. But of those 63 total children who were hoteled last night, one third should have never entered foster care. Again, under state law, a child must be legally dependent, abused or neglected to enter foster care. Foster care is not designed for children who are not dependent. It diverts resources from children who are abused or neglected, demoralizes our workforce who feel powerless to fight back and cannot stay up to date with their caseloads. And most importantly, it inflicts irreparable damage upon vulnerable families. Under Georgia law, juvenile courts are required to exhaust every possible alternative before ordering a child into foster care. Through juvenile code reforms, according to our staff, judges are now required to do far more, but their ranks might not have grown in proportion. Most still comply with the code by ordering preventative services, closely monitoring family progress, and when necessary, holding a child's caregivers accountable for not meeting their needs but often grappling with their own high, high caseloads, which delays reunification, termination of rights, and adoption for children in care, some courts do not strictly adhere to the law as written. And DFAX receives custody of children with complex needs who are not legally dependent. Without getting too nuanced, there are three basic pathways. A child enters our custody through delinquency proceedings initiated by the local district attorney, through child in need of services or CHINS proceedings, or dependency proceedings. In some of these cases, we may receive custody with no notice and as a result, no opportunity to advocate for less intrusive interventions. But always, these youth enter defects custody based on the concept of abandonment or as cited by the judge in the custody order, the parent's inability to meet the mental health or behavioral needs of the child. We often call these orders custody from the bench, and almost inescapably, the case involves a mentally and behaviorally challenged preteen or teenager with any, more, any one or more of the following characteristics. Suicidal or on the verge, homicidal, low IQ, anxious, depressed, autistic, nonverbal, violent with a history of criminal charges, delinquency, and psychiatric stays. How do these children become known to the court? Often at hospital discharge or release from detention, the child's caregivers no-show or they threaten it. They may be scared or claim that they're scared for the child's safety or their own. They may be struggling or claim to be struggling to find the right services and treatment. Across Georgia, there's a pervasive yet false belief that DFAX has special access to services and treatment, especially psychiatric residential treatment. For those parents who are truly struggling to help their high needs child, your heart breaks. That child does not need to enter foster care to get what they need, but it happens all the time. 
There will be no evidence of abuse or neglect, but these days especially, it is tough to find behavioral services, psychological counseling, and psychiatric treatment for children. Under state law, a nonverbal teenage boy is not dependent, abused or neglected, by virtue of his autism diagnosis and his aggressive behaviors because he struggles to communicate. A human trafficking victim is not dependent because she runs away, struggles with PTSD, and suffers from active addiction. A suicidal nine-year-old who cannot navigate this new world of cyberbullying and societal demands for perfection is not a dependent child, but her parents are probably struggling to find the right treatment even if they have private insurance. Those children need health care, not foster care. As for those parents whose decision making is far more callous, they may have learned through the grapevine that threatening abandonment or actually doing it gets a difficult child off your hands and you will never face criminal liability. Using some real life de-identified examples, mom might have a new boyfriend and her high, new, high needs autistic son is straining the relationship. You might have a low IQ teenage boy who is a victim of sexual exploitation by a family friend and then perpetrates against a sibling because his unresolved trauma has manifested in tragic behavior. From the parent's perspective, these children have become far too inconvenient and uncontrollable to stick around. The cops get called or their parents drop them off at the local office. Once the parents show up to court, they're quick to sign away parental rights and it's rare that they'll be asked to explain what they've done, if anything, to get help for their child before we reach the point of no return. In these cases, we may technically have dependency because actual abandonment is neglect under the law, but it could have been avoided with earlier, more forceful interventions with which DFACS could have assisted without removing the child from the home. None of these children should have entered foster care, but once they do, given the complexity of their needs and with heartbreaking precision, they will disrupt every placement until there is no foster family, group home, or psychiatric facility willing to take them. If they weren't traumatized by real abuse or neglect before they reached us, they are now. Immediately or eventually, they will be hoteled and at great cost, diverting precious resources from abused and neglected children in our care and burning through their caseworkers who might be the only adult in their lives with whom they have a real connection. Foster care is also not designed for extremely violent teenagers, sometimes with known gang affiliations, charged as adults for serious criminal offenses. But I want to be clear, we are not referring to those children victimized by a life of adversity through no fault of their own, now being victimized by a system in which viable alternatives exist. We are concerned about those young adults charged with the gravest of crimes, with no desire to change course despite a history of judicial grace and many legal reprieves. Foster care is not equipped for a juvenile offender charged with raping another child at gunpoint or a crip wearing an ankle monitor for auto theft with a restraining order for violently and repeatedly assaulting his father. But they so often enter foster care in lieu of detention altogether or following a short stay without mitigating efforts. Again, we're not advocating for a blind crackdown on misbehaving teenagers. We know these issues are tough and gray. But imagine a newly minted, master's degree wielding, 20-something year old social worker with 20-something cases on her plate who gets an email at 3 p.m. on Friday, subject line, court order attached, still gathering info, to go pick up a teenage boy charged as an adult for rape with a long history of violence alone in her Honda Civic. She'll probably quit right then and there and foster families and group homes are reluctant, which is putting it mildly, to accept such violent youth, such that if we initially convince someone to take that child, the placement won't last. They too may just quit. No more children with similar circumstances will ever be accepted by that foster family or group home. Immediately or eventually, they will be hoteled at serious risk. This session, we will offer legislation to fix statutory loopholes, ambiguous definitions, and contradictory terms to better serve vulnerable families, keep more families safely intact, and bolster our efforts to eliminate hoteling. Backed by the governor, these, measure, these measures were carefully crafted over many months by a coalition of veteran juvenile court judges, child welfare attorneys, and child welfare staff. If we want to end hoteling in this state, we desperately need these changes in state law. We humbly ask for your support and we look forward to working with you when we unveil these proposals in the coming days. 
Ideally, in setting aside whether a child properly entered our custody, we would be able to immediately access their records to avoid misdiagnoses, contraindicated treatment, and wasted resources. Currently, however, we lack real-time holistic access and on our own, on our own record keeping for a child's time in foster care needs work, is issues which with your ongoing legislative and financial support, we are in the process of correcting. When we're able to track down paper copies, hustle relatives and friends for information and eventually get our hands on child-specific data pre-foster care, we often see a child who was already enrolled on Medicaid or at least eligible for it but did not get the right services and treatment to mitigate the health issues now landing them in our custody. Theoretically, their family had health care at their fingertips. On an interagency level, unprecedented opportunity for positive system change is actually within reach, particularly involving health care for vulnerable families and children, including youth in state custody and those receiving adoption assistance. Once a child enters foster care, they are enrolled in managed care Medicaid, absent some very narrow circumstances. DCH manages this contract, which is currently run by Amerigroup through a plan called Georgia Families 360. And that covers each child's health care, not their room and board, unless treatment has a residential component, such as inpatient substance abuse or residential psychiatric care. In accordance with federal mandates, Georgia Families 360 must cover medically necessary health care, whether or not such services are covered under the state Medicaid plan. And states have leeway to define medical necessity, except that it cannot be more restrictive than the federal standard. Simply put, our children do not fit traditional actuarial models. They often reach us missing basic vaccines, dental care, and vision care, and they are reeling from trauma. Abused and neglected children need timely, comprehensive health care. But far too often, case managers and foster families are told that the next available appointment is weeks or months out. And I know some of you have called me about this very issue. Many providers struggle to file the right paperwork to show medical necessity. Denials are frequent and ambiguous. Resolution can be slow, and providers regularly complain about late, complain about late payments, so they leave. Leveraging a newly built team of Medicaid attorneys, paralegals, and administrative support, we now appeal every denial, taking the burden off of our frontline staff. We are undefeated, 100% success rate so far, and we often pay outright for treatment while we appeal, spending roughly $57 million, all state dollars, in stopgap health care last fiscal year. Early this, earlier this month, DCH formally initiated competitive bidding for managed care Medicaid, including coverage for our children. In a formal letter to the department, we detailed current issues, asked for specific improvements, and requested a seat at the table to craft coverage review submissions and wield equal enforcement authority to address future contractual noncompliance. We would deeply appreciate your support as we pursue these changes, working with our sister agencies to effectuate better access, quality, and outcomes, especially for dependent and recently adopted children. Between Medicaid unwinding, hoteling, workforce challenges, challenging the status quo, and taking risks to improve a tough but vitally important agency, making these moves despite the oft forgotten reality that our department usually does not enter a family's life except on the bleakest of days, making heavy decisions and sometimes imperfect ones. Despite all these challenges old and new, we remain resilient, focused on our mission to strengthen families, and we are energized about Georgia's future because real change is underway. Working alongside my health agency colleagues, we will end hoteling once and for all. With Commissioner Noggle's leadership at DCH, healthcare access, quality, and outcomes will improve for vulnerable children and families across the Peach State. If we can address a child's needs earlier, and more effectively, we can avoid foster care altogether. And if we cannot, we will have more high quality, loving homes for our youth with better Medicaid coverage. Under new leadership at DBHDD, we have a true champion in Kevin Tanner. If more families can access Georgia's safety net for medically, mentally, developmentally, and behaviorally complex children, fewer will enter foster care and more will be empowered to, gra to gracefully age into adulthood. And we continue to collaborate with the child welfare community in our shared mission with those who always put the best interests of children at the forefront. Thank you for your leadership and support today. And now I will turn it over to Commissioner Tanner. Hmm. Two hard acts to follow. 
again, no need to reintroduce myself, but I do want to thank my colleagues at the sister health agencies. As you can hear, they, they both have tough jobs. Uh, one of the things I will assure you, we are committed at DBHDD to working alongside Commissioner Noggle and Commissioner Voice to provide uh, help in this area. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things we are doing at DBHDD currently. As you can see from Commissioner Noggle's presentation, DBHDD serves as a safety net for the safety net when it comes to youth services. Essentially, that means DBHDD is responsible for the uninsured youth or the 75,000 youth in Georgia who receive SSI Medicaid. A lot of times people don't understand that DBHDD doesn't provide services for most of the youth in Georgia, especially those on Medicaid. Those are managed, as you heard, by the managed care organizations. But it's important to me as the new commissioner of the state's behavioral health authority through to, to make sure that we're in lockstep with each of our sister agencies, often our team members' expertise and working hand in hand with them to make sure Georgians have access to services that are critical to their long-term success. Already I've had several conversations and meetings with both the other commissioners, and I know they share these values and a commitment to working together to improve health care outcomes for Georgia's children. I know our time here is brief, but I want to take a few moments to highlight some of the initiatives that I think will help us further these goals, as well as some partnerships we have with our DFAX partners to ensure youth are safe, supported, and that we do all we can to keep families whole. First, I want to update you on a project that under, is underway uh, from House Bill 1013 or the Mental Health Parity Act, which is MATCH. An important goal of the Behavioral Health Reform and Innovation Commission last year was seeking to improve interagency collaboration around behavioral health care issues involving children. The bill reinstated the multi-agency treatment for children committee in Georgia called MATCH. And this group of high-level leaders from every child-serving agency in Georgia who are charged by law to work together to make sure our children can access every available resource in this state to meet their treatment. Bobby Cleveland, the former executive director of the Toll Foundation and a widely respected leader on child well-being here in the state of Georgia has been appointed as chairwoman of the match committee. Most people who know Bobby know that she is an out-of-the-box out thinker and an effective leader. So while this group is just getting organized, I'm looking forward to what's to come from leadership from this collaboration. Current work regarding interagency collaboration. I want to lift up some of the work that our department does to help keep families intact uh, with parents who are dealing with substance abuse disorder while they're receiving treatment. In partnership with our community service boards and DFACs, DBHDD offers residential treatment services in a family-focused environment to mothers and children and pregnant mothers, allowing them to be with their children while they seek care. This environment allows mothers who get treatment to practice healthy parenting skills with therapeutic child care, and it supports them with a team of clinicians and peers. Most importantly, this program keeps families together keeps children from experiencing the trauma of entering foster care, as you've just heard from Commissioner Broyce, and it improves their chances for long-term success. Currently, Georgia has 21 of these residential programs, plus 13 outpatient programs, 13 transitional programs, totaling about 425 residential slots and 395 outpatient slots. This is important work, and I look forward to working with Commissioner Broyce to make sure every family at risk of foster care because of a parent's substance abuse use has access to this program in the future. We're also working with DFACs to improve outcome for kids who come into contact with DFACs and who have a disability. Our teams are currently aligning policies and practices around youth in foster care who will eventually age out and require the support of now or comp waivers. Our staffs are currently working to develop sustainable practices that ensure DBHDD is aware of youth who are in foster care and eligible for waivers, and the two agencies can properly plan for the transition from foster care to adult waiver services. The goal of this work is to make this transition as smooth as possible for young adults with disabilities so they can continue to receive support, the support they need, no matter their age 
or their status. In addition to making sure the state is properly planning for long-term care of youth with disabilities, we're also working with our providers to cultivate homes specifically for those transitioning uh, into adulthood. Currently, we have a limited number of providers who support youth in foster care and young adults on the NOW and COP waiver program. We'd like to see those numbers increase so that young adults don't have to move to a new home just because they turn a certain age and the agency paying for their community support changes. Finally, I just want to preview that DBHDD is developing a pilot program aimed at improving outcomes for youth who are in a psychiatric residential treatment facility. The targeted population for this program is youth in DFACS custody. Youth at risk of entering foster care and who are in a PRFT settings in Georgia or out of state. The project is still under development, but I'm excited that our goal is a more seamless continuum of care for youth and young adults in Georgia and one that meets their complex support needs so they can have the best shot in having a good life. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that. In closing, again, I just want to thank our sister agencies for, the, uh, in my short time here, we've had multiple meetings. I'm looking forward to continue to collaborate. One of the things that DBHD is committed to is we're not going to say they're not our youth or they're not our responsibility. We're going to work together with our sister agencies to find real solutions to addressing these problems. So with that, I'll be glad to answer. I know we'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Tanner. Before we go on to questions, I'm going to ask you know, the other two commissioners to come up. And colleagues, you know, we've heard three very capable commissioners talk about three subjects and, or more than three subjects that are very complicated. And some of them definitely tear at your heart, others tear at our pocketbooks. Um, but I want us to thank them for the work they are doing to, be, to break down the silos of non-communication and non-working together that have existed. And I'm confident that they're going to succeed at getting rid of hoteling, decoupling what we need to do. I mean, with the Medicaid doing the job that they've got a, a heavy deadline on. And I just want to thank you all for the hard work that you've been doing and that you're going to continue to do. And I pledge my support to each of you in anything I can do to make your job successful. And I hope that many of those in here will also. And I also want to thank Chairman Tillery for having the idea to do this. So thank you, Chairman Tillery. And now we'll open up for questions. Leader Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to, the, to the committee who just made that presentation of riveting, Kansas, I, that is, I know that our caucus is absolutely committed, as it is with yours to ending hoteling in the state of Georgia. We're committed. Um, as you talked about Medicaid unwinding, just for those who don't know, on Friday, uh, I, along with members of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus, dropped a bill to expand Medicaid and to deal with Medicaid unwinding. Uh, and so I invite my Republican colleagues in this space where we're working together to end hoteling, let's work together to supply health care to all Georgians who need it. Uh, I have several questions, but I'll try to be brief along unwinding first, then Medicaid expansion second. Unwinding currently, there about you said about 834 people you currently have working. Uh, what is the actual number that you need in order to have a successful unwinding period? And then what is the cost per person that you hire? Is it meeting the need? or should that cost be higher? So we were fortunate that when we ran the same projections to anticipate what we thought we would need in terms of workforce to, to get through the caseloads with the new volume in addition to our existing work, we submitted those figures to the governor and he included the number that we needed in the budget. So you'll see there's um, new funding for 300 additional eligibility workers. That will get us where we need to be. It's in our base budget and we would really very much appreciate your support. That aligns with what we think is appropriate for our workforce to 
be successful. Um, and then if you will remind me of the other part of your question so that. Yeah, so what is the actual amount that you're paying folks? That from gotcha. what I understand is around 30,000 bucks. Is that enough to actually cover the cost of uh, mm -hmm. bringing someone on to the workforce that you guys have? Is that mm -hmm. enough? Well, we've benefited from the, the recent um, employee investments that was supported by this body last year. That has helped us be far more aggressive in not only our retention efforts, but also in um, recruitment. So we have seen turnover actually lessened um, compared to this time last year. We have used some flexible funding sources to provide salary supplements at no state dollars required to make sure that people knew that we recognized their hard work, and we've used other strategies like allowing more teleworking. Um, again, all those things combined seem to be working for us. I, it, also, I'll say we've done some recent surveys from, from employees, and it doesn't, of course, pays up there, but it's not at this moment for our department as a whole, maybe not for this specific division. For our department as a whole, the biggest complaint is the workload life balance. It's not actually salary any longer. So we think with the new COLA that's in this, um, in the big budget, the previous investments, and then continuing to be flexible and allowing them some work-life balance that we're gonna be successful, especially as we gear up for Medicaid unwinding. Great, so uh, I'm just gonna stay here just a little bit. Um, the ex parte, I think that's a great thing that you guys will do that, but if we expand Medicaid right now, we go from around 72% federal funding to 90%. Also, those people would come onto the rolls right now. And that would save a lot of money with the hiring that you have to do to ramp up the unwinding. What are your thoughts about expanding Medicaid now in order to lower the cost, increase more folk being on the rolls and doing the work of Georgians to give us all health care? Well, from our perspective, um, I think you heard in my remarks, right now we struggle to get children in foster care in front of Medicaid providers. So that's a serious concern on our side that we need to make sure that that is being addressed. And then of course, Medicaid expansion, just technically speaking, would um, take away private sector insurance from roughly 200,000 people right now um, and put them on safety net health insurance. So I would say those two things are, are big concerns for us. And you know, I think it was in Ohio, it took some time for them to prepare the state and make sure their existing Medicaid programs were ready for full expansion. It wasn't, you know, a one year, two year deal um, based on what I've heard from former Governor Kasich's remarks. But with that, I'll, I'll see if there's anything that would be our perspective on right. it. Thanks for the unwinding. I'll go to Medicaid now, if you don't mind. Uh, so if we were to expand Medicaid to 138% of the poverty level, then we would pick up 400, 450,000 more people would be uh, enrolled. Right now with the governor's waivers program, it's gonna cost about 150 million bucks. How many people will that actually cover in the state of Georgia? You know, I think we're in a, I think those estimates originally pro were probably around 50 to 60,000 members when those numbers were originally calculated. I think though because of the public health emergency and how many members we have on right now, as you heard me say, we've added over 570,000 members to the Medicaid rolls in the past three years alone. This next 12 months, there's gonna be so much movement of members coming on and members coming off. I think those estimates are really tricky for us to nail down right now because we need to see what the income level is of the folks that are still on Medicaid. We've done some back of the envelope projections right now we we believe related to pathways the 1115 pathways to coverage waiver there may be upwards of 200,000 members already on Medicaid that would qualify for that waiver that they will be transitioned to that waiver during their eligibility redetermination if they're eligible and so that's what we're focused on making sure remains an option for them this summer thanks the last question then I'll, I'll, I'll yield um, if we were to expand Medicaid right now it'd be about 300 million dollars and it would cover, so it'd be two times the cost that it would be to do the waiver, but you cover about 400,000 more people. I'm just trying to get some sensibility around why is that the case and we haven't done it yet, just given being fiscally responsible. Uh, could you help me understand why that's the case? 
Those decisions are not entirely up to the department, so I can't answer the entire question for you. But I would tell you what some things that we would look at would be that the out year costs. So while there are some initial investments that are made available up front, I think when you look at the long term cost of expansion, I think that's when a lot of people start looking at what that really feels like. And back to the commissioner's comments as well related to workforce and making sure that we're ready and able as a state and as a provider network to support those members. Thanks, Commissioner. I do have a question just to follow up on the minority leader's question. If if Medicaid were expanded, we'd still have to go through the unwinding, correct, to not figure out if individuals who have now crossed whatever level Absolutely. Something is set at it. Or All 2.7 million members must be to have their eligibility redetermined regardless. Right. We know many will stay eligible. Since many of our age-blind and ended. disabled population will always be eligible for Medicaid, but they still have to go through the process. I have one question on that same topic, and you've hit on it, but I guess more, maybe more of a statement than a question. I would love to see Georgia lead in the ex parte um, world. The fewer people that we have to touch face to face and the more we can do through other systems we already have, I think is better for our people uh, and better for, better for our citizens and better for our employees. So please keep us up to date on what we can do to make sure we lead on that effort. Thank you. Chairman, Chairman Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to each of the commissioners here, thank you. Uh, in light of the uh, minority leader's question, uh, I'm going to take a little different uh, path. I'm far more interested in the discussion about all those populations that Medicaid was originally created for, and uh, to your points, each of you, how we better serve those people. That is where I think our focus needs to be, and that is where I'm, I'm hearing you go today. And so I want to say this first of all so that everyone is clear. About 57% of our Medicaid budget goes to 25% of our population that are the age blind and disabled, the people that all of you touched on today, I spent a lifetime, I spent over three decades serving those populations. And so I wanna ask, I wanna make a statement and ask you this, one of our biggest challenges in serving these individuals, all that you touched on, whether they're IDD or independent care waiver or children or you know behavioral health, aging, you name it, are those with behavioral challenges that you alluded to so well, Commissioner. Behavioral challenges, the problem is, the resources out there are out there. You cannot find behavioral therapists. You cannot get the help you need. And so, uh, Commissioner Tanner mentioned the rate studies. The rate studies that are now being done are going to be invaluable for us going forward because historically our rates were not set by rate study. And so we really didn't know what the rate should be. We just kind of had the rates that we had and they weren't based on real costs. And so my question is this, I hope that going forward, regardless of waiver and regardless of what program or what service that we desperately need, that the, the departments will see value in using rate studies so that it's not the providers that are saying this is what the rate should be and it's not advocates saying it, and it's not the department saying it. It really should be based on the real data that is hard there right in front of us, and my hope is that y'all will advocate for that. But thank you for your service. Really excited about each of you, and thank you so much for your comments. I, I appreciate that question and comment. I just, from on behalf of DBHCD, I, I would agree, obviously, we have some rates that haven't, be re, haven't been revisited in 17 years. Um, uh, you've probably saw some information come around about some of the private beds the department utilizes for behavioral health uh, and the fact that we've gotten some notices from those folks that are no longer going to provide that uh, resource to us if we don't um, up those rates. So uh, you all directed through House Bill 1013 a couple of rate studies. Uh, I know DCH is doing one that Commissioner Noggle can talk about. We did one on the DD side for our population. Um, it's, it's looking like it's going to be about a 40% increase would require about a 40 percent increase in those rates um, but you hit the nail on the head with everything we've been talking about and i know commissioner royce feels this if we don't have providers and if we're not able to cultivate providers and the workforce to do the job none of us are going to be successful in what we're trying to accomplish 
because uh, one of the other challenges, and I'll tell you this, is on the Behavioral Health Reform Commission, what we saw over the last three years is we have a lot of providers in Georgia that will not take Medicaid. We have a lot of providers in Georgia that don't even take health care insurance. They just take private pay. Um, so the workforce is our number one biggest challenge we've got to find a way to address. And I, I can assure you, the three of us are going to work hard to try to find ways to address that. But the General Assembly is going to have to take a serious look at those rate studies because um, it's going to be necessary. Sure, thank you for that, Commissioner. And I'll just echo what he said. The Department of Community Health was instructed in House Bill 1013 to conduct a pretty comprehensive rate study, and we've shared a draft of that. I think a near final version hit my inbox last night, so we'll put some finishing touches on it and share that. And we've also developed kind of a, a fiscal analysis projection of, of what it would take to do that. And I'll give you a couple of highlights, if, if my memory serves correctly. I think on average, some of our across the spectrum of behavioral health providers in the state, I think to get to where we need to be with the other states that we compared, we need about a 25 to 45% rate increase. That comes with a price tag in state funds of close to $180 million. So certainly there'll have to be some further conversations about that. We'll be happy to share that with you, but, but we should be delivering that report to, in a final version to folks here in the next couple of days. Chair Lady Dempsey. Thank you. Um, you know, as we walk away from this, a lot of you that are here that have served for a while know that many of our members have toiled in this field for a very long time. Uh, the pandemic, the emergencies that have happened has cer have certainly escalated the needs throughout our state. I want to tell you that I think, I, I don't want you to walk away from here sad and depressed about what we've just heard today, because it is heavy. This is a heavy lift. But it is robust with opportunity. So once you realize that as we are here, we do hold great opportunity. We have three very qualified people that know of what they speak and that are prepared to help take us forward. So when you leave here today and you kind of walk away from this and this was the closer and it's like, oh my goodness, how are we gonna do that? I'm gonna tell you that we are. So just, just hang on and get ready for the possibilities that lie ahead. With that, I think it's that a great transition. Uh, sorry for the others of you who have questions, but as we roll into this last part of the budget, we're gonna ask the three commissioners who you've just heard to present their a amended FY23 and then FY24 requests, and, and if they have questions they wanna take after that, they, and we have time for that, we'll do that as well. Ready when you are, Mr. Chairman. All right, good afternoon again. Um, I, I'm definitely not going to introduce myself again to you, but uh, Chairman Tillery and Hatchett uh, asked us to spend the next 15 minutes with an update on the progress with major investments for the current physical year and a brief overview of the governor's budget for DBHDD. All right, first I want to take a moment to focus on DBHCD's number one priority from last session, and that was our state hospital workforce. For our newer legislators in the room, I think it's important to understand that a majority of our state employees that work for DBHDD work in the state psychiatric hospitals. About 80% of our workforce, of our 4,600 workforce, work in one of our five state-operated psychiatric hospitals. What you see before you is a picture of the impact that COVID had on that hospital workforce. As healthcare workers around the country experienced burnout and healthcare salaries became extremely competitive, DBHDD really lost ground in this area, experiencing a net loss of more than 1,200 hospital employees. To keep hospital open, uh, hospitals open despite these losses, DBHDD began relying heavily on contracted staff from Jackson Healthcare. This support was due in large part to the department's partnership with DCH and the blessing of Governor Kemp to use ARPA funds to augment the staff at the hospitals. And since these funds have expired, DBHCD is now attempting to self-fund this support. The FY23 budget 
made a commitment made about a 24.5 million investment in making DBHDD more competitive in this market. And thanks to the pay adjustments, it enabled us to turn the tide on our losses, resulting in seven straight months of net growth in staffing levels. It also helped the department to bring back employees who were dedicated to the mission, mission but seemingly left just because of low wages. 25% of the people who have come back to work for the state hospital since June are former employees who came back to DBHDD based on the prospect of higher pay. This progress is gradual and mainly in non-clinical direct care positions, housekeeping and food services, where we're able to raise salaries for some of our lowest paid workers in these hospitals from $16,000 a year to around $25,000 a year for our food service workers. But it is important and encouraging progress, especially after 30 consecutive months of net losses in hospital-based employees. What is also significant about this progress is that this has allowed DBHDD to begin to reduce its reliance on staffing from Jackson Healthcare. Before the pay package, we had contract staff in nearly every type of position throughout our hospitals, but now we're primarily relying on them for nurses and health aides. Today, there are still 460 Jackson healthcare staff in our hospitals, which represents 25% a 25 reduction since June of this year, last year, June 22. While I'm glad to see this progress, my priority is to replace all of these resources as quickly as possible with DBHDD employees. These contract staff are expensive and come at a cost of $1.6 million per week. So we want to replace them with DBHDD staff who are not just more cost effective, but they're also more committed to the mission of the department. This slide shows you how the, the pay has enabled us to serve more Georgians. We've been able to open up 90 beds across the hospital system since March of last year. Some of you will recall last year's budget language directed DBHDD to bring 45 state hospital beds at Georgia Regional in Atlanta and 47 beds at other state facilities online by November 15, 2022. This number fluctuates a bit on a daily basis based on a variety of factors, but for the most part, this progress in opening beds has been steady since July. But again, this increased capacity is more reliant on the support of Jackson Healthcare than we'd like. Though we were through the targeted pay increases for clinical positions, they are still proving elusive. The biggest challenges that remain are recruiting nurses, psychiatrists and psychologists and physicians. As y'all know, I've been here about 30 days, so I'm getting my arms around some of these challenges. But I also want to continue to work with you all to demonstrate our accountability with the money you've given us to solve these problems so far and to continue to work on solutions so that we can end our reliance on Jackson Healthcare and to deliver on our mission to serve Georgians. Moving on, our mission to provide home and community-based services and supports to Georgians living with an intellectual developmental disability. Last session, y'all made an historic investment in the two Medicaid waivers DBHDD administers. The new options waiver program called NOW and the comprehensive supports waiver program called COMP. We utilize these waivers to enable more than 13,000 Georgians living with a disability to remain in their homes and in their communities. But we know at least 7,000 Georgians who need these supports or will need them sometime in the future. The Governor and General Assembly recognize that need, funding 513 waiver slots in the current budget, which is more than any year in recent history. In that appropriation, you also gave us money to bring back some of the administrative staff that DBHDD lost during the budget reduction in 2020. This has helped us enroll individuals at a steady pace and will help us make sure that we fill every funded slot this year. You can see from the uh, slide in front of you there that we need to average out at about 42 waivers a month to meet our goal. And, we typically see a reduction in November, so we feel confident we're on track to meet our goals. We're proud to be able to fulfill that promise, but we're also accurately aware that the workforce shortages in our system are making it difficult for Georgians who are entitled to our services to access them. 
As I mentioned in earlier testimony on the DOJ settlement, we know our reimbursement rates for both behavioral health and now and COMP are out of date and are limiting the capacity of our network. When we don't have enough providers, our providers reduce their footprint because of an inability to recruit and retain workers. We have to face the heartbreaking reality that Georgians who need this specialized care and support simply cannot find it. In extreme situations, this means people end up in the emergency room or in settings where they don't belong for weeks and legislators get those phone calls. While DBHDD staff work around the clock to locate providers who can support them back in their home or in the community. Just last week, our staff was working with community hospitals around the state to find placement for 26 people with disabilities who were stuck in emergency rooms for non-medical reasons. We must address these workforce shortages on a systematic level so that Georgians can access the quality health care and community support they're entitled to receive. As I mentioned in the DOJ presentation, there are two rate studies underway, both funded through the 2023 Appropriations Bill. This is an important step toward the systematic workforce solution, and it will serve as the foundation for our efforts to stabilize our provider networks. The slide before you gives you an update on the status of those rate studies. This work is a priority to me, and over the next several weeks, we'll be meeting with you to dig into the details of what we're seeing in our preliminary reports, what we've heard from our public comment period for the now in cop rate study, which ends January the 20th, and what you can ultimately expect in the final report. We anticipate the now in cop rate study to be complete in March, or April, and we intend to keep this committee as up to date as we can throughout this process. Here's what we know preliminarily about now and COMP. The early report suggests that provider revenues should be increased by 40% overall. The impact would vary by provider based on the services they deliver and the needs of the individuals they serve. It is important to remember these drafts are recommendations and the public comment period will inform the final report. So I want to say to you, this ends the 20th. So if you're receiving phone calls from providers concerned about the preliminary rate study, encourage them to participate in the public comment period. It's extremely important. Their voices are heard. That's part of the process. And our, uh, our staff and our consultants want to hear from them as this rate study becomes final. But I also want to take a moment to thank the governor, this committee, and other members of the General Assembly for recognizing and committing to address these needs, which are so critical to our ability to provide access to quality health care for those we serve. Now I want to take a moment to talk to you about the impact of recent investments in our state's crisis continuum. DBHDD, as the state's behavioral health authority, manages the state crisis response line oversees mobile crisis response services and operates the 620 crisis beds for children and adults across the state in partnership with community service boards and other providers. This is an area where the state has seen a tremendous increase in demand since 2020. And we anticipate the demand to continue to rise as the federal government begins marketing 988 crisis line later this year. On this slide, you will see where the state has prioritized new funding for the crisis system, including federal, state, and one-time COVID dollars over the last two years. Much of this has been in preparation for the rollout of 988. What you also see is the impact of these investments on DBHCD's ability to meet this rise in demand for service. Starting with the left column, you'll see call volume to the Georgia Crisis Access Line also commonly referred to as GCAL, has risen year over year since the beginning of the pandemic. GCAL initially struggled to meet demand, but the funds George invested, the funds you invested, here have reduced call response time tremendously. For more than 200 seconds in 2020, and 21 to less than 10 seconds today on average. Skipping over to the column on the right, we also are building up bed capacity to meet the increased need for short-term crisis behavioral health care. This year, we will bring 45 new beds online in high demand areas, thanks to the funding that you provided, including an 18-bed psych bed facility at Grady, 
which will fill an important systematic gap serving individuals with medical needs who are experiencing a psychiatric crisis. We anticipate with 988 we will need to build many more beds and we will be moving forward with a recommendation from the Behavioral Health Reform and Innovation Commission to conduct an outside study of bed capacity needs both for behavioral health and IDD crisis so that we can better qualify what types of beds we need and where the beds should be located very soon. I've committed to both OPB and to your chairman that we will be providing a strategic plan for the next couple of decades on where those beds need to be located and what cost we'll be looking out to build out the network. Finally, I want to briefly touch on mobile crisis response services. This is essential, this is essential service dispatched by GCAL when they determine a clinician needs to respond to a behavioral health crisis. Generally, these clinicians travel to the individuals help de-escalate the crisis situation, evaluate the person experiencing crisis, and depending on the circumstances, connect them to an outpatient appointment or crisis observation for stabilization. We've had a nearly 40% increase in the demand for these services over the last three years, and response times have crept up alongside that demand. DBHCD used some of the funds to expand reach of these clin clinicians through telehealth, and in a moment, you'll see that the governor has prioritized investments in mobile crisis to help us meet this rising demand. Again, workforce is central to the integrity of building out our crisis capacity. While building out these beds and serv services will remain a priority, I cannot underscore enough that our ability to staff crisis beds and to support much of this work will be affected by the outcome of the Behavioral Health Provider Rate Study. Now I want to take a moment to talk about 988. For those of you who don't know, as of July of last year, July of 22, 988 is the new three-digit dialing number for anyone experiencing a mental health or substance abuse issue. In Georgia, these calls are answered by our staff at GCAL. Because the number is easy to remember, Georgia's call volume is expected to double once marketing begins. We have not started marketing that, pro that number yet. This will mean all the downstream services like mobile crisis crisis response and short-term stabilization will be affected as well. Already, without widespread marketing, GCAL has seen more than a 10% increase in call volume since 988 went live just this past June. July. The map you see on the slide shows where that demand is coming from. When you adjust the call volume by population, you'll see that rural Georgians and specifically South Georgians have been calling GCAL and, and 988 at a higher rate than their counterparts in Georgia's metro areas. This is not a huge surprise for those of us from rural areas. It also tracks of what we've seen with data around rural suicide rates in the state of Georgia and what we know about access to outpatient care and stigma associated with mental health in rural areas of our state. Now, as you saw in the previous slide, Georgia has been able to man manage 988 demand thus far, but we don't have any our laurels to rest on. With federal marketing starting in the fall of this year, we will, are gonna have to be ready for the increased demand. There is no wait list for people in crisis. We must be there for Georgians when they need us. 988 offers a promise of life-saving health care to Georgians experience mental illness and substance abuse disorder, but it will be up to us to fulfill that promise. My last update related to FY23 funding for DBHCDs addresses some of the initiatives that were put forward as part of the last session's historic focus on mental health. One of the things I am most proud of is the work that I did with Speaker Ralston and members of the Behavioral Health Reform Commission and what you did last session in passing House Bill 1013. What you see in this slide is some of the results of that work. The map on the left depicts locations of out assisted outpatient treatment, AOT, co-responder pilot programs in the state, many of which were funded because of the Mental Health Parity Act and the passage of Senate Bill 403. In the interest of time, I'll save a detailed update for this discussion for subcommittee hearings, but I will go ahead and preview for you that this is another area where the shortage of Georgia's clinicians is a real challenge. 
Okay, now I want to quickly cover the George governor's budget proposal for amend the amended budget and also FY24. You'll find this on page 111, 111 in the governor's uh, budget book. This slide covers all statewide changes, including the 2000 cost of living raise. Uh, you'll see this in all the department's budget, so I will not spend a lot of time on that, but we'll be glad to answer any questions at the end. The governor's budget proposes 10 million annualization of funds for the 513 now comp waivers that I referenced earlier and another 4.2 million for 250 additional new comp waivers slots for FY24. Also in the IDD services, the governor has proposed a budget neutral consolidation of respite program budgets. In adult mental health, the governor has proposed $6,288,973 for additional mobile crisis response teams, which we spoke extensively about today. Um, I've told you earlier that we saw a nearly 40% increase in demand here, and we expect that number to double over the next few years. Here you will see where Governor Kemp's budget proposal annualizes funding for crisis beds that we added this year in Augusta. He also has proposed in 2024 funding for a development, the development of a new behavioral crisis center in Fulton County, which is one of our number one priorities for crisis beds, and a conversion of an existing crisis stabilization unit to the more modern behavioral health crisis center model in Dublin, Georgia, a great part of our state. The governor's proposal also removes $932,000 from the budget to account for the behavioral health provider rate study, which was funded and has been completed, as I mentioned earlier. His budget also eliminates $261,823 for opioid legislation that did not pass this past year, so obviously no need for the funding. Last slide here, looking at our direct care and support service program budgets. The governor's proposal is removing about 1.97 million in the amended budget to account for vacancies at our hospitals in the first few months of the year. So these are dollars that, where we were not able to bring those beds online and had vacancies. He also has proposed a 9.9 .9 million addition in the amended budget to facilitate a kitchen renovation at Atlanta Regional. It's a much needed renovation to the kitchen there. Finally, for fiscal year 2024, the governor has proposed an additional $2 million to help the department maintain its five hospital campuses across the state. Those of you who are not familiar with DBHCD's operation, we have a lot of buildings and a lot of property across Georgia, and most of those buildings are old and are expensive to maintain. In closing, I want to thank you for allowing me to come today and spend so much time with you covering what I believe some of the be the most some critical areas. And like Chairman Dempsey said, I think we have great opportunities ahead uh, with these agencies working hand in hand with the General Assembly and with the Appropriations Committee and the Governor uh, to continue to lead the way in some of these areas. That, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I think you uh, answered the questions in your uh, detailed presentation, so thank you so much. I thank think you. we're good with that, and we'll move to the next commissioner. Thank you a lot for being here today. I know we put you on, on the stand a lot. Commissioner Bros, would you like to go next? to make my remarks as thorough but brief as possible given the hour. Um, so starting off, um, primarily my remarks are, are geared toward the amended fiscal year um, recommendations from the governor and then the big budget. So I'll cover those really quickly and then talk through some of our previous funding. Um, so in amended fiscal year 2023 in the governor's recommendations, page 219 for departmental admin, um, the governor has recommended $1,965,580 for technology and security upgrades to Georgia Gateway, which I talked about earlier is related, related to Medicaid unwinding. Um, that will 
support security enhancements for things like multi-factor authentication um, and also allow us to buy better technology to have more dynamic legal notices. So instead of just having sort of a hardwired form of legal notices going to people, if we need to adjust it on the fly to better reach someone and let them know what they need to tell us or, or what we need to give them, we will have that functionality and that will be outside of Georgia Gateway. Um, also on the same page, 219, under Federal Eligibility Benefit Services, um, I mentioned, I hadn't mentioned this yet, actually, there's $5,765,760 for a management consultant who will be quickly retained by the state to come in and do another review of our operational readiness and make sure that we're compliant with federal law and mandates um, before we start unwinding. So that that effort will be underway immediately and um, the work will be quick to make sure that we're good to go especially following the following the department of audit and audits and accounts review last summer um, again on page 219 there's um, six hundred and sixty two thousand four hundred and twenty three dollars to pay for 80 additional Medicaid eligibility caseworkers that we have already hired, which is great. Um, this will cover their salaries for a quarter's worth of work, and then that will dovetail into the big budget where we have new funding for 300 additional eligibility staff in, the, in our base budget. Um, there is some additional funding for our administratively attached agencies, or I guess one GVRA. I will let um, Chris Wells detail that further, and then that will move me into the big budget really quickly. Um, again, I want to thank the governor's recommendation for another cost of living adjustment, which is really critical for our staff and um, our efforts to retain them and recruit um, talent for all the work that we do in our agency. and. Then moving on to page 222 for child abuse and neglect prevention services, there is a recommendation of $184,926 to reflect collections from the Children's Trust Fund. On page 224 for federal eligibility benefit services, um, again, those are the 300 additional caseworkers that we're gonna need for Medicaid unwinding and our other activities that will continue during that time for SNAP, TANF, and related programs. And um, in the big budget, there's additional funding for several administratively attached agencies, but I will focus on the Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Children Fund Commission, which I chair. On page 225, um, the governor has recommended $89,613 to reflect collections for that commission um, in accordance with state law. And there is an additional $3,375,000 um, to increase the amount of funding that the commission has to direct to um, trafficking survivors and when we with your support if we're able to secure that additional funding then we will certainly operate in accordance with the first lady's vision to get these resources to survivors to the nonprofits that serve them across our state and help them on the path to recovery um, this Thursday before our subcommittee, I will speak much more in depth about how our agency deployed funding recommended by the governor's office and championed by the legislature for fiscal year 2023. But just to cover some highlights, um, there was money added in the budget for um, in in DFACS child welfare to allow us to contract with community action treatment teams, which is based on a model they used in Florida. It's basically developing a healthcare team that instead of um, the child having to go to them if they were at risk of entering foster care or in foster care in a placement, we can deploy the team out to serve the child in their home and hopefully prevent foster care altogether. That procurement has been posted. Um, our agency has had a dramatic number of procurements over the past year, so I can assure you um, Department of Administrative Services has been working at lightning speed with us to get that posted um, for competitive bidding. And um, we, another addition to that budget was funding for autism research. We're working with Georgia Southern University and um, Dr. Michelle Zena in South Georgia, who really is an expert when it comes to children with autism, to actually determine the prevalence of autism among children in foster care in Region 12. Already, um, I don't want to give too much away, but the prevalence that we've determined so far is pretty startling. I think that we initially suspected roughly high watermark 30% of that sample of children to um, fail the initial autism screening and then be 
um, be confirmed to have autism. It is much higher than that. I would say double is what it's looking like at this point. But again, we've got to work through the entire population to actually best determine the prevalence, and that will be part of a Georgia Southern um, approved and monitored research project that we'll share with you as soon as it's ready. Um, with the increased pay I mentioned in my previous remarks for our staff, that has meant directly lower turnover. Um, and we are very, very thankful for that, especially um, now that we are slowly emerging from COVID, we have been able to retain some really quality staff and, and that has been a huge part of it. Um, there was funding added in our budget across several programs for increasing the amount of money that we pay for our special assistant attorneys general that handle our, that represent the state in child welfare abuse and neglect proceedings, but also when it comes to the Division of Aging Services and Public Guardianship and plus child support enforcement. Those SAG increases have been um, incredibly helpful for our attorneys and the representation they provide to vulnerable Georgians on our behalf. I can tell you that um, it goes through two levels of review. Initially, an invoice from one of our SAGs goes to the Attorney General's office, and then they come to us. I, right now, at this very moment, we have no outstanding invoices. So that has been great. We've been able to get caught up, work closely with our SAGs, and they are appreciative, too, of that increase. Um, Several things, I'll, again, I'll, t I'll go through this in much more detail. We have been really hitting the ground running because we wanted to come back and have favorable reports on every dollar that you gave us. Um, one of the biggest, though, would be the increase in per diems for the providers, the foster families, relative caregivers, group homes that care for our children in foster care. We have successfully implemented those. I'll share the rate schedule so that um, you can see what those numbers look like. And um, we are in the process of expanding Georgia Memory Net. You gave us $3 million for that. Georgia Memory Net is um, a coalition of clinics for um, determining dementia and Alzheimer-related um, disease in elderly adults. We have um, a presence at several hospitals across the state. We are in the process right now of of um, deploying that $3 million expansion with RFP processes, uh, sorry, responses being evaluated by our team as we speak. I know I didn't cover everything, but we are very, very thankful for your support. We are making tremendous strides in our agency to use those dollars wisely and serve families. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think we do have one question. I think, is it uh, Representative Holcomb? Is that right? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, I, I have two questions I'd like to get specifics on. First is, uh, it's encouraging to hear that your turnover rate has declined. Can you give us more specifics in terms of where you are on that, uh, if you have it? Uh, and then secondly, um, with respect to uh, page 225, the Safe Harbor for Sexually Ex Exploited Children Fund Commission and the increase there, uh, one of the issues that I looked at in the interim between the last session and this session was for pregnant victims of um, human trafficking. And my understanding is that there are no agencies that provide that service. There are those that provide services to pregnant women, and then there are uh, agencies that provide services to sex trafficking, but none that do both. Are you aware of that? And if so, is there a plan to address that? Thank you. So I'll start with the first one. Um, using the, the most recent information that we have available, so this would cover all the way through December of 2022, um, we as a, as a department overall, we have a turnover rate of 12.8%. But when you actually look at what we call the front line, the, the people who are working directly with families, the um, in the grand scheme of thing, things, the lowest paid employees in our agency who are doing the, the life and death work every single day, our turnover comparatively um, for Department of Aging Services advocates, child support services agents, um, social services specialists, which are the child welfare frontline staff, and then economic support specialists, which are those individuals that are processing Medicaid eligibility, SNAP, TANF, and related programs. We have um, some smaller margins, so child support and child welfare, we're looking at 1.2% lower and 1.8% lower, um, respectively, when you look at December 2021 to December 2022. Not huge, but it is definitely helping. And um, when we're looking at aging advocates, 
the same time frame, December 2021, December 2022, it is 7.4% lower um, for Melody's team for economic support specialists um, at a really critical time given what we have on the horizon. We have um, turnover has reduced 4.5% uh, overall. And then for talking about um, young women who are pregnant and they're trafficking survivors. You're right, it does seem siloed and it's certainly something that um, working with the governor's office, OPB and all the health agencies, I think there's an opportunity to find um, sort of a state agency home for, for trafficking survivors. Um, we, when, when we're looking at, on the child welfare side, some of the increased federal flexibility that we have due to changes in federal law, like through the Family, um, Families First Prevention Services Act, that lets us use Title IV-E funding um, more flexibly for preventative services, there is a whole section in federal guidance that would allow us to leverage more um, of that 50-50 match with Title IV-E funds specifically for trafficked and pregnant youth. I think that is a fantastic opportunity and it's one that we're exploring more in depth. It's a little nuanced, but, um, but that, could be, that could be a great opportunity for the state to expand services for those, that specific population. Thank you, Commissioner. You've uh, exhausted the board, or perhaps we've exhausted the room. I'm not sure which one it was, but I uh, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you for being thank here. You. Last and certainly not least, uh, Commissioner Noggle. While we get that squared away, I promise I'll be pretty brief this afternoon. We only have $19 billion to talk about, but, but I'll keep it at a high level. I'm not going to go line by line. I'm just going to give you the highlights on what we saw across our last uh, two budget years. But I do want to just mention that I've had such a great opportunity over the last year and a half or so to work with a lot of really awesome health care providers in your communities and in your districts, and I would welcome the opportunity to go visit hospitals and skilled nursing facilities and other providers in your districts with you and talk about what their successes have been and how we can better support them. So please call me any time that, that we can do that together. I'm going to try to just touch on a couple of things from 22 and uh, amended 22 and 23 maybe that I haven't already talked about um, today. Really the last two years, the governor and y'all were really, really good to the Department of Community Health and those budgets represented hundreds of millions of dollars, not just for FMAP changes and, and, and normal growth formulas, but for actual increases in services and benefits to Georgia. And I've just highlighted a few here. $350,000 in FY22 for dental rate increases, $190 million to match the home and community-based services ARPA funded plan. We've talked about $230 million for the state health benefit plan and amended 22. Nine million last year for rural hospital stabilization grants that were awarded to 10 hospitals last summer. We added coverage for donor breast milk for $1.4 million and over $130 million for provider rate increases and quality incentive payments to our skilled nursing facilities around the state. Many of these things resulted in those state plan amendments that we talked about. Most of the ones from FY22 have been approved. A couple are still hanging out there. If we look at what's in FY23, as our, just a friendly reminder, our base budget is $8.2 billion, 4.4 of that in state funds, 96% of our budget is directly uh, budgeted in Medicaid. And so I've, again, just, just pointed out some highlights here from the things that, that are still mostly in process with, with CMS. 10% reimbursement rate increase for our long-term care, uh, acute care and rehab providers, additional funding for dental increases, adding in medical nutrition therapy as a covered benefit in, in Medicaid, 32 million for therapeutic services, which started as an initiative just for foster care, but, but because CMS expanded to the entire population, and that's adding things like behavior aids. We're eliminating attestation, that old requirement that providers attest to their meeting certain standards, which ultimately will provide uh, additional rate increases to 108 different primary care procedure codes for physicians around the state. We are extending postpartum coverage to a full year, $83.5 million, expanding express lane enrollment for $117 million, $47 million in federal funds, $15.8 added to the Ingenuit Care Trust Fund, and I'm going to circle back to that one in a moment, and then a couple others you can see there. 
Again, most of those are state plan amendments. Most of those are still pending. I think the dental rates and postpartum coverage have been approved. I will tell you, we were very coordinated in our effort to queue these up with our board and public comment, because that determines when they become effective whenever we get CMS approval, and they will all be retroactive back to July 1 if and when we get CMS approval. Many of you heard me talk about this project, our directed payment programs, but I want to highlight it briefly for you again this afternoon just because it's such a significant piece of the work that we've done with so many partners across the state. And this is what that $15.8 million supported um, in additional DISH funding. These programs were developed in an, effort, in an effort to leverage additional federal funding, promote access and quality health care and to support our health care workforce. I'm going to focus on the bottom three that you can see up here because they're the ones that have been approved most recently. Georgia Aid is a program that targets services at both Grady and Augusta University, our largest provider of Medicaid services and our state-owned and operated hospital. And it aims to increase health care outcomes and access. We're going to raise their Medicaid rates, not a little bit, but all the way up to their average commercial rate. The trick is, is that 10% of that fun new funding is contingent on them meeting certain healthcare outcome metrics. Georgia Strong is a program for 21 teaching hospitals around the state and aims to support our workforce by requiring reinvestment of up to 20% of these new dollars to go directly back into their workforce education and training. We're gonna raise their Medicaid rates too, 200% above what they are today. And in, in the end, we anticipate about excuse me, between 50 and $100 million be, being reinvested into the workforces within those hospitals. And then the private hospital directed payment program is an expansion of our existing public hospital directed pay, payment program, and we're going to raise those Medicaid rates up to their Medicare equivalent as well. All of the programs that you've seen today have been approved by CMS and represent an additional $1.6 billion being directly funneled into hospitals around the state, and it costs no new state dollars. The real magic of these programs, though, was what is this next slide, and maybe what you've called, heard called the waterfall. The final piece pending with CMS is how we allocate DISH, or our disproportionate share hospital funding. The state receives a federal allotment annually that's set by the feds of $435 million. Up to now, we've allotted about a static amount, about 65 or $67 million, and it, doesn't, it really just changes a little bit with inflation every year, to, to small rural hospitals, and then everything else went to our urban hospitals. Well, because of the programs that we talked about on the other page, Grady actually hits a limit where they're capped out on how much funding they can receive from us, and it frees up over $100 million. So we've submitted a state plan amendment to reallocate these dollars. We're going, to we're going to funnel that $100 million in savings from Grady to our small rural hospitals first. And then anything that's left, we'll send to the urban hospitals after that. What this really does is eliminate all the uncompensated care, nearly 100% of uncompensated care costs for small rural hospitals around the state will be eliminated. And then if you don't know what uncompensated care costs is, it's a calculation of the value of the care that they provide to the uninsured and the amount that Medicaid doesn't cover. We're gonna eliminate those costs for all small, small rural hospitals around the state and cut it in half. For, every, for the entire state. So again, major initiative by the department over the last year. We couldn't have done it without extra money to match the dish for private hospitals and without a lot of support from hospitals and providers around the state that worked with us on this project. Switching over to the governor's budget recommendations for amended 23 and 24, there's a total savings and amended 23 of $230 million in state funds, but an overall increase of 1.2 billion federal and other funds. This is accounted for by about $283 million in Medicaid utilization and growth, over $500 million in savings from the continuation of the public health emergency where we continue to get an enhanced FMAP, that 6.2% from the feds, although that will start to go down beginning in April. The $423 million that we talked about in SHVP and a number of yes items directing the department to add new services or benefits in a number of different areas and essentially we'll figure the money out later. One item I do want to call your attention to is the $8.8 .8 million in the ambulance provider fee. This, this fee was authorized in statute a couple of years ago and, finally, and adopted by our board this past fall. Essentially, this is recognizing a new provider fee for private 911 ambulance providers so that we can again 
leverage additional federal dollars. By leveraging this $8.8 million, we get to draw down $20 million from the feds and ultimately increase payment rates to 30 private 911 ambulance providers around the state to the tune of $28.5 million. Again, they're paying for it, not with state general funds. So recognizing those funds there. And then FY24, a total of $366 million in state funds and $1.4 billion in federal and other funds, the bulk of that being in that $1.08 billion in SHPP, $312 million in Medicaid utilization and growth, $52 million in additional benefit funding for Georgia Pathways to Coverage, a recognition of prior year savings to the tune of $150 million that's being carried forward, and an instruction to use $82 million in existing funds, so we can again update cost reports to the 2021 cost reports, which will result in increases to some of our skilled nursing facilities. And finally, about a million dollars in statewide changes, which includes the COLAs, and we're obviously very, very grateful for that for our staff. So that's a very high level. Obviously, I'll go line by line and in great detail during our subcommittees, but happy to answer any questions that, are, that you may have this afternoon. Do any of the members have any questions? <coughs> Commissioner, I just have one. Do you know uh, if we do that dish waterfall, what is the, I saw the 105 million that you're able to reallocate from Grady. What is Grady's um, expected gain from that as far as covering uncompensated care? I think you said Grady and AU. So their directed payment program benefit between the two of them is about $345 million. 345, and that's Grady and AU? That's Grady and AU, and we can get you the breakout. Thank you. Any other questions from any of the members? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, oh, we do have one, sorry. That's okay. last, last late minute. Uh, I've got uh, Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is the F map for the Georgia Pathways in the 60% range? Is that? Uh, uh, is that right? It follows our normal F map percentage, okay. which is about, it, it varies every year, 67, 66%. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Thanks. Are there any other questions? Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. you being here today. And members, we have now made it to the end of the agenda. Thank you so much for your time. Commissioner, I mean, I'm sorry, Chairman Hatchett. Yeah, we're not letting you leave us for anything else now. Do you have anything you'd like to add at the end of the day? Thank you all for hanging in with us. A lot of good stuff. See you tomorrow again, same time. No, different time, different 9 a.m., same time. place. See you at 9, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah.